and we spoke with you uh, shortly after the Sandy Hook Elementary School uh, massacre. 20 children killed, six staff members died. A lot of people were saying, well, this is a turning point. The United States, uh, definitely something will happen. There will be a shift and the power of the NRA will be reduced. But uh, given this recent announcement, it doesn't seem to be the case although i mean there are there seems to be some effort um you know to limit who can uh purchase guns but a lot of people really see this as just a, a token effort and not really getting to the heart of the matter i mean why do people need assault weapons uh t- to begin with and and i think you're absolutely right to put it in the wider context of how violence is used um by the state in this society no, no, I, you know, I, I mean, this, this infatuation with violence is uh, as something that is, is not only simply a spectacle for entertainment, uh, but also something that basically has now become one of the primary elements and registers for mediating all relationships. It seems to be so ingrained in, in the American uh, collective psyche that it becomes difficult to uh, think about an alternative. I mean, let me talk. Let me give you two specific examples of how that works out. I mean, think about how the notion of security is now defined in the United States. It's almost entirely a personal matter, you know, mobilized by a kind of panic and fear about big government uh, or basically about an attack on personal safety. I mean, we have we have no discourse for talking about the kind of fears that are justified that emerge out of the lack of social protections, out of the lack of social provision, out of the the attack on the welfare state. I mean, I mean, from 9/11 on, from 1980 on. Magnified now, of course, by 9-11, I mean, you, you have this massive national security state that is rooted in a legitimation of state violence and one of a, a kind of hyper-individualism that really is the perfect storm for rejecting almost any notion of, of what would be called a legitimate attempt at, at, gun, re, at gun reform in a, in a way to really address both systemic and individ, individual forms of violence. It becomes almost impossible given the way, not impossible, but it becomes very difficult given the way those forces begin to interact. I mean, I see the, the, the basic resistance to gun violence in this country, I'm, I'm sorry, the basic resistance to gun control in this country is really part of a larger sort of neoliberal logic in, in which what, what is really being said is not that we need to defend the Second Amendment. What is really being said is, well, look, sorry, we don't want the government interfering with anything. That, you know, this is the Wild West. And uh, this kind of hyper-individualism that the market supports is a perfect legitimating register for that. Yeah, and I mean, if you contrast the fact that the U.S. military certainly is armed to the teeth, so are people in the United States. Uh, uh, people living in the United States own an estimated 270 million firearms, so there are approximately 90 guns for every 100 people. So that means only 10 out of 100 people are not armed and every year approximately a hundred thousand people in the United States are victims of gun violence and among young people that's overwhelmingly youth of color that are victims of gun violence and then of course there is the weapons trade um, international weapons trade and the trade between the U.S. and Mexico where we know of close to more than 40,000 people uh, being killed in Mexico in the so-called uh, drug war. So this has wide uh, repercussions because the number of, of um, people in the United States killed each year are greater than those killed in Vietnam, greater than uh, U.S. troops uh, killed in the U.S. Uh, uh, Iraq war or the Afghan war. But nevertheless, business seems to be ticking on as usual. No, I, I think it's, it, it's really, for me, it's, it's, it's really an important point. I, I mean, nobody really wants to talk about the fact that gun, guns are big business that the weapons of war are big business, that we live in a militarized culture that it really touches almost every aspect of daily life. I mean, you know and I know that some of the biggest gun makers in the nation are owned by private equity funds run by Wall Street titans. Whether we're talking about Siberia's capital management, Scenes capital management, Mid-Ocean partners. I mean, these are people who trade off death. I mean, that's what they basically trade off. They make money on the fact that they, they sell weapons of death. I mean, you, you increasingly have a society that in which civil society itself is now mobilized for the organization for the production of violence. And, and the question that has to be raised, of course, is not just simply what are the effects, but who benefits? 
I mean, who benefits from this? I mean, what, 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 who are the people who basically have a just, uh, what, what they would consider to be a justifiable instance investment in the organized production of violence? And, and I think that until we begin to realize that there's big money here, this is about corporate power, this is not just about the culture, uh, you know, we're really in trouble, especially when you have a politics that's entirely dominated by money and by lobbyists. Yeah, and um, uh, we're going to have to leave it there. But apparently now the Governor Cuomo of New York State is now backing off. They had uh, passed a, a, a so-called tough uh, gun law after the Sandy Hook uh, massacre. But now he, uh, the governor seems to be backing down uh, from that. So we'll see how all of this uh, plays out. Joe Biden, the vice president, is meeting with Mayor uh, Michael Bloomberg today. We'll see if anything comes of that but um, taking your point uh, Dr. Henry Giraud about who's profiting from all of this you know there leaves a little hope really that um, I, I we're going to see an assault weapon dying ban. as a result of this kind of institutionalized violence I mean yeah. secondly it seems to me what this speaks to is the fact that traditional notions of politics as we know it are dead that until we get social movements that in fact can be broad based that can organize and redefine the notion of politics in ways in which we don't equate questions of capitalism with democracy, then maybe we'll go somewhere. But until, if we increasingly rely on these politicians in both parties, in the traditional parties who are basically center and right wing, to solve these kinds of problems, we're in trouble. 